thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to Alex, Hugo, and to Zeynep. Um, good morning. Um, I'm very, very, I already said this yesterday, I'm very glad that we finally can all come together. Um, those who, with which I've been uh, talking or we've been discussing for the last uh, two and a half years, those who I just uh, met yesterday, I think it is uh, very, very uh, promising crew here. So um, I just like to say a few words on uh, some of the like basic assumptions, the ideas that motivated this uh, this conference um, and especially this panel, of course. Um, like I think yesterday we had a very beautiful uh, evening at the springtime in Berlin, and uh, the pandemic like somehow feels like close to over. But of course, um, it is not really. Um, and we know that there's uh, a massive uh, surge in inequality. Um, we have like massive uh, health problems. There's a lot of discussions, which I think we socially have to digest and work on um, a lot. And of course, um, especially here in Europe, the um, war um, that Russia started against Ukraine has been um, yeah, also like a very profound um, shock uh, during the last um, two, two and a half months already, I think. Um, so the, the speed, the sheer speed of, of the crisis, which is uh, in, in this title and part of this discussion, um, and the speed of the decomposition of, um, of like the world order as we knew it um, is pretty breathtaking, I would say. Um, so, aside from the springtime in Berlin, um, this is of course what we will be discussing. Um, the title of our conference is Contesting Authoritarianism. Um, by contesting, uh, we found like a word which we think uh, somehow grasps the uh, discursive uh, dimension, the reflecting upon, contesting it, cost, contesting it with a sharper and better analysis and so on. But I, we also mean, of course, the practical, actually political, political um, counter strategies by this. And the subtitle of our conference is Perspectives from the South, which I already mentioned yesterday briefly. Um, um, that uh, what we mean by this um, may require some explanation. Uh, I think yesterday everybody agreed that we don't like the idea of Global South, which is like a kind of NGO term. Um, what we mean by perspectives from the South is more like an epistemological positioning, uh, positioning within if you want class or social struggle um, from, to the side of, if you want the subaltern and those who struggle um, and so on. Um, like in terms of Boaventura de Sousa, for instance, who's talking of epistemology, epistemologies from the South, um, Southern theory and so on. Um, but of course, there's also a geographical reality to the question of the South, um, like what we imagine many times like as a question of, let's say, center periphery um, relations. Um, but I think it's important to reflect upon this and think about it. And I think it may be like a misleading um, spatial metaphor. Um, and this brings me like to a like a like more general um, question on how authoritarianism is discussed, especially like in Europe, which for a long time has been seen as uh, something happening at a distance. Yeah? Authoritarianism was in a way like something that happened uh, beyond the European borders and countries such as Russia, such as China, such as Turkey, maybe. Um, and there has been quite uh, like general political social shock when things started to becoming closer. Yeah? Um, Hungary, Poland, but also, of course, uh, the UK with Boris Johnson, uh, the US with Donald Trump. So some, somehow, like authoritarianism in the perspective that I feel in mainstream discourse from here, authoritarianism left this, um, uh, this bubble of the South, 
and came here like as an as, as an experience. Huh? Um, and this is a discourse was of course like neatly opposes liberal democracies to authoritarian regimes or what they call a lot of times populist regimes, um, like a, a, a neat separation where one starts, the other ends. Um, and I think this is uh, of course a very um, problematic, um, uh, very limited understanding. And just, um, I was just this morning thinking about what we discussed with uh, Himat. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you know this, but during the weekend in Berlin, all uh, Palestinian uh, demonstrations have been prohibited. Uh, everything remembering the day of the Nakba and uh, the assassination of the uh, Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, I think she's called. Um, so every demonstration in Berlin uh, that had anything to do with Palestine was banned by Palestinians, by Jewish peace movement, by leftist organization, which is, I, I would say it's pretty heavy. I think it's something that we may not have imagined like five years ago. Another thing um, is the passing of the um, 100 billion euros um, rearmament or arm armament uh, program of the German military and the um, uh, uh, the will of the current government to um, to to put a two percent of the GDP um, for each year in financing of uh, the German military, which is a highly undemocratic, a highly authoritarian way and process, which changes uh, very profoundly how, um, in this case, finance is distributed, um, and which is like authoritarian dimensions within this so-called liberal democracy. And just uh, because I know that a lot of you have been struggling with this, I just want to remember of the European border regime, which is a regime which is not just the border in itself, but it is a policies of, um, of um, control of bodies in a very um, um, specific way where some bodies and people are produced with rights and some people are produced with bodies with persons, uh, collectives um, without rights. So I think it's important to recognize how authoritarian practices are actually a um, um, very integral part of what we understand as liberal um, democracies. But I think this is not the other, not the only continuities that we observe. I think um, there is a question of how these liberal democracy ha democracies have historically um, supported uh, authoritarian regimes elsewhere, like from outside, uh, from au outside of Europe, if you want. Um, and there's also a very important question of the, like, let's say, historical continuity and discontinuity. This is something that we are definitely going to discuss a lot. The question of um, what the relation with uh, between this authoritarian turn, this authoritarian constellations, and the so-called, like, let's call it like classical neoliberalism, what has even been termed by Nancy Fraser, like as progressive neoliberalism, what the actual relation is, what happened to neoliberalism to produce like this kind of outcome and what is like new and what is um, like well known to us. Um, and the last point um, I think which is very important to notice is the question of um, of where we are actually, where we look at when we talk of authoritarianism, yeah? Um, the, because um, there is a tendency in mainstream discourse to um, uh, discuss authoritarianism as a question of regime type analysis, so to say. Um, we are talking a, bit, a lot about, um, the, let's say, social authoritarianism, yeah? Not only as a question of opinions, but as a question of practices embedded within society, but of also of the, um, let's call it like social infrastructure and how authoritarian practices are deeply inscribed within this. Um, I think all of this is um, very important and I think uh, to actually tackle these issues and grasp it, um, we have to discuss the relation between certain practices, types of opinions, but also po political mobilization, emotions and so on, um, in relation to social power relations, class relations, but also um, relations of um, race, relations of sex and so on and so forth. Um, so I think um, 
this uh, to, to, to grasp this like specific amalgam of class relations, patriarchal, racist violence inscribed in society and so on and so forth is something that makes the difference, one of the important difference between a critical assumption of, um, of authoritarianism and a limited, um, let's call it liberal reading. Um, and there are tr uh, tricky questions um, about this, like the question of who actually mobilizes whom within these authoritarian movements, um, ideologies and so on. Why certain attitudes or historical practices um, gain historical importance in this moment and not in another moment. Because I think there is a question of like the attitudes of, for instance, most Germans have not really changed, like the amount of people who have like racist uh, or uh, far right uh, worldviews have not changed. but. Why are they politically mobilized and by whom are they politically mo mobilized nowadays and why? What happened to neoliberalism that it needs or it seeks in a way um, the ultra conservative, uh, patriarchal um, and so on uh, reactionary dimension? Why is this necessary or is it not necessary? Is it just like some outcome that could not have been foreseen or that is just accidental? So I think this, um, what we are looking at is like a specific uh, articulations between state and state power, which has been uh, discussed with the, with the idea of authoritarian state, statism, authoritarian statism, for instance, a question of um, culture, discourse, ideology, emotions, effect, um, which has been problematized by, by Stuart Hall, for instance, with the idea of authoritarian populism, and um, specifically, and to grasp like the specificity of the moment, also the question of um, the relation to economy, to labor and capital relations, to the general process of commodification, um, which uh, the theory on authoritarian neoliberalism, for instance, by Burak Tansel, which we've been discussing a lot, um, has problematized in a, in a very interesting way. Um, and um, I think for this setting that we are having on the conference and also on the panel, there's a like, very important question of the question, and Wolfram has been working on this uh, question and um, published a very interesting study on the globalization of authoritarianism. Like, um, what is happening? Why are we um, observing or living like this global wave of authoritarianism? How are these actual global entanglements? Um, how can we conceptualize these family resemblan resemblances, if we want to? Um, and what um, actually connects these different authoritarian experiences? Like, is there something, I remember Matteo Salvini, who, uh, who, who wanted to, who was dreaming of a nationalist international. Yeah. So what is there? Is there any like material basis for this? Is this just some wet dream of uh, the far right or is there actually um, something happening that we can um, observe? This? And so to discuss these issues, we decided to um, like partake in a way with the concept of crisis. Um, I suggested the idea of a crisis of civilization, which is something that has been discussed in these terms, I think mostly in Latin American discourse. Um, we are hearing a lot on multiple crises in German, uh, Vielfachkrise. Um, what in very broad terms we mean by this is of course a condensation, a densification of different types of crises who are like mutually enforcing itself um, and to touch like very different aspects of um, social, economic, political um, life. Of course, like in the most obvious sense, uh, maybe we are speaking of this um, often, uh, often cited crisis of neoliberalism which has been going on, I think, for 15, maybe 20 years, if we start like the, thinking about the contestations in Latin America, which already happened like from the late 90s on. Um, so neoliberalism is in a crisis for a long time, and of course, like on a global scale, at least since 2008, 2009. And then we have like this zombie neoliberalism, like real walking dead um, that has, in my eyes, very little, um, ideological power, very little capacity to actually convince anyone of anybody. Now, nobody assumes himself or herself as proudly neoliberal, very little people. Um, 
but it's still there. And why is it still there? What's happening? What's, what, what, how is this um, actually articulated? And then to, uh, uh, to finalize this just with um, two ideas, which is one uh, idea which is uh, being quoted a lot, um, which is the idea of the interregnum by Gramsci. And I just want to read you very quickly the, um, the quote, what he says on it. And he says, if the ruling class has lost, lost its consensus, that is, it's no longer leading but only dominant, exercising coercive force alone, this means precisely that the great masses have become detached from their traditional ideologies and no longer believe what they, have, what they used to believe previously. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying, but the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great vi variety of morbid symptoms appear which is a very well-known quote. And uh, just after the uh, Russian war against Ukraine started, I read an article by Mike Davis um, with also a very beautiful quote <laughs> and a sad quote at the same time, of course. Everyone is quoting Gramsci on the interregnum, but that assumes that something new will be or could be born. I doubt it. I think that we must diagnose instead a ruling class brain tumor, a growing inability to achieve any coherent understanding of global change as a basis for defining common interests and formulating large st scale strategies. So I think this question of how we will define common interests, how we are formulating, I don't know if large scale strategies, but any strategy for a different path for society is something that um, will move us um, during these days, um, as well as the question of what, uh, like what we are actually observing within these ruling classes. So these are some of the aspects that we will discuss in this conference and for this panel today. And now I'm very, very happy um, to share this panel with um, Alex Demirovic, with uh, Zeynep Gambetti um, up there on Zoom, <laughs> and with Hugo Fanton. Um, so I'd like to um, start with um, you, Alex. I will present uh, the three of them um, just before they speak. So um, Alex is a social and political scholar. Um, he's been a professor at the Institute for uh, Social Research, or working at the Institute for Social Research. Um, he's been a professor author, I think, in Berlin at the TU for a time, and is um, at this point a senior fellow at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Berlin. Uh, he's also hosting in German only for the time, but a very, very interesting the theory podcast uh, and highly uh, successful theory postcard, Too Long Didn't Read, it's called. Um, so without further ado, um, Alex, um, go ahead, welcome. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Doris. Thank you, Boris, for your outline of, of all these relevant issues. Um, first of all, I want to say a warm welcome to you all. I'm also a member of the board of the Stiftung. And to tell you, I'm really proud that Boris was so successfully able to organize all this. I mean, I think this is one of the important things. We invest so much time and also me to invest so much time to be able to do these things to this kind of gathering and organizing these discussions that in my eyes are so important. I think this is one big thing the Stiftung, the foundation can do in Germany Hopefully we will succeed to have more money to do more in this way. It's not at all clear. The left is um, under pressure as, as you may know. And I think that's an important issue because that um, it gives us a an, an hint that the, the left also here in Germany is really endangered by recent political, economic um, developments. Um, this saying, yeah, so I learned from Burris that um, in Latin America debates, there is 
it is a discussion about crisis of civilization. We, after the financial market crisis in 2008 and the following years, we discussed it in the, the um, context of attack Germany as a multiple crisis. So this is the way I discussed it and I published a book on this idea of the multiple, multiple crises with different forms of crisis in different fields of our society and articulating each other and what we hoped for was a kind of a condensation process to use the term of Louis Althusser. This means that these different crises developing in each social field could um, um, intertwine, have impact on each other, strengthening or enforcing other crises. And so maybe there could be a condensation, this was our expectation, a condensation of kind of a break um, of capitalist society. Because in our eyes and also in the bourgeois context, it, was, it seemed to be that the bourgeoisie also in Germany didn't saw any future for itself. That was so important. I mean, it was a kind of, how to say, it was a kind of a, it, for a sh very short moment, it seemed to be a kind of a double power constellation. And that gave an inspiration to the idea of an interregnum, you know, for a very short moment. Because leading journalists, leading intellectuals of the German bourgeoisie and also of the Swiss bourgeoisie, yeah, they were arguing there is no future for our project of our capitalist and neoliberal project. It's done, the left is right. This was the way how they interpreted the situation. And for us, it was a kind of, an, of a crisis constellation, a conjuncture of, of multiple crises. So now I'm looking back on this issue and I think, yeah, with all the debates now on the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene, that um, had been developed during the last years. I think we have here, from, I mean, this, it's kind of a, an alternative. We have also to integrate in our discussion the idea of a crisis of civilization that is much deeper than only a crisis, crisis of capitalist societies that reaches far deeper into the whole development of our society since long, not only the last 400 years, but even we have to take into account longer developments. And I think someone like David Kraber in his last posthumous book make proposes uh, some of these arguments. Though this is, this is what I think about and what for me that is the, the basic assumption that, I mean, it goes back to Marx and uh, remarks on what the bourgeoisie wants to know or not to know. And for him, it was clear that the bourgeoisie, it doesn't want to know all the stupid things the bourgeois class is doing. They don't want to know about the monsters and the walking deaths and the zombies they produce. Yeah, they, they want to be ignored. They develop so much science and so much knowledge, but they don't, they don't take it seriously. I mean, remember what was one of the first things Trump did, stop to fire, to subsidize research on climate change, yeah? so. This is really a serious problem that the bourgeois society likes to be stupid. And this is, that for that reason, it is so important that the left is part of a movement, how to say, that brings rationality and knowledge, committing knowledge into our society and the social processes we live in. So knowledge, knowledge-based, activities with long perspectives are, in my eyes, one of the most important um, political things to do. 
in my eyes, the right-wing movement after the financial crisis was important for fighting exactly against this kind of knowledge. The knowledge about the reason, the, the, the reason, the development of the financial market crisis. To stop this kind of knowledge, to stop those movements, and to remember that we, all, I think all of you, and like me, we all have been very enthusiastic about this big, huge wave of social movements after the financial crisis in 2011 until 2015. There was a strong, strong movement, a wave all over the world. You know, and not, it's not now the time to to go into the details, but you are here and coming from these backgrounds, I think you are familiar with all of this. And I think this is a, it was a strong reaction to these movements, yeah? In, in the United States, when you think of um, Me Too and, 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 and Black Lives Matter and, and all the and, and environmentalist groups, yeah, they, they are fighting for, for a better world against the exploitation of nature and the class use of, of, an, on, of environmental policies by the US government. So I think this is an, an important context for, for um, explaining the upraising of the right. This is so one argument. Another argument in this context, is, I mean, it's just loosely articulated, just to give you an idea, an idea very shortly what, how I see the, these problems. I mean, in Germany, very often the right-wing movements are interpreted as something that, is, um, that raises up spontaneously by accident. And how is that possible? So this is the way how newspapers and the media are discussing this problem. It, it, it's, it always, again, seems to be a surprise that there is still a right, yeah? still nationalism, still racism. So the journalists, they seem to be very young, very uninformed, and for them it is a surprise. But when you, you go into the details, you can say there is long, long developments of the right. Yeah, with the long development of ideologies and transforming strategies, transforming the ideologies, the own practices. And of course, I think you are, maybe, may not, but, but in a way familiar with these developments when you think of the new right, the French um, keyword, a um, developer like um, Alain de Benoit, who, who, who developed these ideas of the new right in the, already in the 60s and in 70s in reaction to the new left. And you can see this is an ongoing struggle also between the left, the liberals and the right. So it, there is not a vacuum. It's not a, 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 a situation, a zero situation. We, we are already in a con continuous um, struggle of, of how the left, how the right, how the liberals are organizing the society, the public debates, the conjuncture, so to speak. Yeah? So in my eyes, these, these changes in the subjects are part of reorganizing the conjunctures and the relations of forces in our societies. So for me, it, it, the, the uprising of the right, yeah, in, I mean, it, in a way, it was, of course, a surprise, the uprising of the right in, the, in 2015, 16, the successes of Trump and in Italy, Salvini and, um, and all the, yeah, the others, in, like in, in Austria and in Switzerland, th these parties, the leaders, the spokespersons of these parties are very strong, influential in the public sphere in organizing the, the class relations, the policies. And um, th what was interesting for me, and that is 
something what is also an element, an, an, a rational element in the definition of interregnum. I'm not arguing in favor for interregnum because I, I'm very on the side of um, um, Mike Davis, yes. Um, but there is some argument in it yeah, that what we could observe is that the societies, and they are still splitted, more or less 50 to 50. Yeah, so the, there is some undecisive moment in the society since 2008. So maybe this is an important aspect for our future political practices. And I, th I think we should take this very seriously that, that there is not a decision made yet in which direction we go. We see it, and I, I, and I mean, this is what, yeah, I mean, what is so important now with the war that happened, that we see that there was a debate, yeah, on a new deal, yeah, on a, on a green deal, yeah, for the next decades, reorganizing capitalist economy. But now, yeah, but now I think all this will be plucked, yeah, by the, by the, an invasion of the Russian army in the Ukraine and all the shifts in West Europe, in the NATO countries, and the, all the in, in the expenditures, yeah, in, in armament that will change and give give us a completely new um, articulation in our societies. That means the, what what is happening so far as I see it, what was in Germany, but also in Austria and other European countries, is a way of successfully integrating many aspects of right issues, right ideology elements, yeah, into the normal political procedures. Yeah, what means there is a, how to say, a shift in the normalized political life to the to the right and um, and integrating this and we in in Germany in particular we can do this that now we have a, a, a minister for for domestic affair, affairs who is referring very often to the anti social democratic anti fascist tradition what is really what really makes a difference to the former Minister of Domestic Affairs. Yeah, so they, they now even the government is starting to fight these currents in our society. So the left has to, how to say, reorient itself in this conjuncture, and I think this coming conjuncture has to reorient itself because the bourgeois government, bourgeois class in itself changes a little bit the way how they deal with, cope with the problem of, um, yeah, how to say, stupidity, ignorance. The further development is, is now under, how to say, under construction, is in a way, um, there is discussion about how to do it. And I think the authoritarian elements will be part of, an, of normalized procedures because no, none of the relevant problems we have to deal with yeah, are solved. And I think this will be a big challenge for all forces in our society and what is a necessity for the, the left to give ideas what is the way we want to go for for the coming decades, yeah, so far, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, that was very, very interesting and also very much on time. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank you so much. So we continue with um, with Seineb uh, Gambetti. Um, I had initially asked Zainab to speak last, but she said she has a very de depressive world view lately <laughs> and didn't want to speak at the end. Um, so, uh, Zainab is an independent political scientist associated uh, to the Bo Bo Bocha Siki. Bocha -Siki? I, don't, I cannot pronounce it. 
thanks, uh, university. Um, she focuses her work on collective agency, ethics and public space. She has carried out extensive research on the transformation of conflict between the Turkish state and the Kurdish mo movement. Um, and we have very recently met at a very interesting uh, conference um, where she spoke a bit about the topics that she will address today. So please, Zeynep, go ahead. Yes, your voice is your voice is okay, but the uh, PA is not okay. I think we can hear you, but uh, only through the computer audio. Um, One second. You could use the mic. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. We we'll, uh, yeah, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, speak. I, is it okay? Oh, like perfect, this? yes. Yes, okay. Yes, it's a self organized technical. Uh, okay, crew. thank you. I mean, there's <laughs> nothing like innovation. Okay, yes, I will be. Um, I'm sorry I'm not there at this time, but there are three conferences on more or less the same issues. Um, uh, one was last month, this was um, in May, and in June there will be another conference in Paris that I'll be attending, so three conferences in a row was, was a bit too much for traveling. Um, but I'm very happy that this issue is coming up so often now. And uh, like Boris said, I'm the pessimist, and my views will slightly differ from what ha has been said so far by Boris and Alex, but I'd like to discuss this further in the Q&A. Um, I want to begin my comments by remarking that as we convene, um, the war in Ukraine um, is, taking, is continuing to take lives, to destroy homes and livelihoods, um, and to displace thousands of uh, people from their lands. But other wars are also being fought elsewhere in the world uh, as we speak. The Turkish army is bombarding northern Iraq, and the Israel-Palestine conflict has flared up once again. Um, but there is a peculiarity to the Ukraine war that I want to bring to your attention. It clearly manifests the fact that wars today are not conducted through military means alone. Ever since the war started, I've been struck by the multiple levels of war-like conflicts occurring simultaneously, um, certain features of which are so unprecedented that describing today's geopolitical alignments as a new Cold War misses the point. Recall that the first move by the US and the EU was to target Russian oligarchs as if the latter were states. Several countries froze individual oligarchs' assets alongside those of Russian banks. Likewise, transnational corporations such as McDonald's pulled out of Russia and Apple suspended its operations, acting as if they too were states. A financial war was launched alongside, or perhaps even before, military involvement by Western governments. What seems peculiar to me is how the Russian oligarchs and transnational corporations are the state-like protagonists of this war, on par with governments and conventional armies. So my first question is this. In today's day and age, where do we draw the boundaries between politics, economics, war and civil society. A second question and shoes. If Russia is described as authoritarian and even fascist, are the forces aligning against it democratic? Are there clear boundaries between democracies and autocracies, between competitive and oligarchic market, market conditions, between the securitization and pacification of populations and outright oppression? My shorthand answer to both questions would be that there is a growing indistinction between colonize and colonizer, financial war and military war, um, state and oligarch, but more alarmingly, between left and right, worker and capitalist, exploiter and exploited, 
and we must grapple theoretically as well as practically with this indistinction. This warrants me to opt for the term fascism instead of authoritarianism, to designate the processes by which democracy is being undermined today in Russia, in Germany, in Turkey, in the US, as well as elsewhere. Both repressive and ideological state apparatuses, to borrow Althusser's terms, have undergone an indigenous transformation. Thatcher's infamous slogan, there is no alternative, um, has ominously heralded the merger between state, civil society, and the private sector. Whether on the left or on the right, political parties are remaining within the parameters of the neoliberal market economy, thereby effacing the differences between political ideologies. Um, as analysts of growing authoritarianism in Turkey, such as um, Boris Alp Özdan, Ismet Akça, and Ahmet Bekman have remarked, I quote, Following the enormous extension of financial globalization after Poulansas's death, authoritarian statism has become a global phenomenon, thus overcoming the distinction between dominant and dominated countries. The rules, procedures, and mechanisms of new constitutionalism, disciplinary neoliberalism, or economic constitutionalism, are not only enforced exclusively in the global south, but are also permeating the global north." Unquote. But if political power and economic power have emerged in complex ways, in such a way that hegemony is cemented not so much from above, but also from below and from all sorts of other directions, we would need to ask what sovereign command any power bloc has on wealth accumulated in world, market, world markets by oligarchs and multinational corporations? What command do states have on metadata collected by private corporations that preside over the most effective means of consent formation in our day and age? Theoretically speaking, the passage from formally institutionalized and compartmentalized societies to informal, dispersed, and multiple flows of capital, information, labor, and subjective investment must urge us to rethink the possibility of a centralized orchestration of violence, ideological indoctrination, or profit extraction. Given this conjuncture, I contend that the indistinction between the political, economic, technological, and affective dim dimensions of power points to a form of totalization that cannot be captured by the term authoritarianism. While authoritarianism can be defined as the abolition of the rule of law and the predominance of the executive, the distinguishing feature of fascism is its ability to move masses to actively engage in violent practices of elimination of alternative forms of life. In other words, fascism is a governmental effect that turns resentment into a compulsive desire for power. The fascist effect, if I may use such a term, results from the practices of either states or markets, or from social media interactions, or grassroots mobilizations. My thesis is that the new forms of fascism that have emerged all over the world should be inscribed within the lineage of the deep societal transformations brought about by neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, I argue, is not limited to austerity measures or technocratic rule, but is rather a governmental rationality geared towards extracting surplus value out of all spheres of life by undertaking a transvaluation of values. Neo-fascism, then, is a specific mode of repoliticization in an age of neoliberal depoliticization. As Eric Alies and Maurizio Lazzarato note, I quote, the new fascisms play on a dimension of the world economy, colonialism, which far from disappearing has colonized the colonizers, unquote. The colony is no longer only what mainstream political science would call the underdeveloped pre-modern traditional countries of the global south but also the liberal democracies of the North. The North now has its South 
immigrants, workers, the unemployed, the poor, etc. Just as the South has its North, the Comprador elite, the financial centers that enrich themselves in global markets, the zones of high-tech production, etc. The meta-colonizer is finance capital, an impersonal force that explodes every limit and opens the way for new imperialist and colonial wars. The so-called Greek crisis uh, of 2008, for instance, is better expressed as a war, an occupation, or a colonial takeover than a technocratic maneuver. But Thatcher's uncompromising attitude towards the minor strike, minor strike in the UK in 1984 was also a war. I refuse, therefore, as different than um, uh, Maurice and Alex, I refuse, therefore, to claim that neoliberalism is in crisis. It was fascistic at the onset, not only in Turkey and in the global south, but also in the US and the EU. It was imposed on the globe through bloody as well as bloodless wars, crisis management as well as the production of more crises, preemptive policing of social upheavals and the production of more instability and insecurity. If these insights are correct, Clausewitz's formula according to which war is the continuation of politics by other means might be invalidated today, since the continuum is between war and economy. There is a war for money, a war for natural resources, a war for the domination of peoples. The debt economy aggravates the polarization inherent in capitalist societies, triggering several interconnected civil wars, class wars, endo-colonialist wars on minorities and immigrants, wars on women, wars on subjectivity. As opposed to the Cold War or industrial era wars, financial wars have no front. The probable adversary is never clearly designated. It is irregular. This calls for constant interventions into the milieu, the environment in which people live and reproduce their livelihoods. Now, I want to attract your attention to the fact that both neoliberal financialization and fascistic seizure proceed by legitimizing the takeover of institutions from within. Uh, the case of Turkey might, be, uh, uh, might help exemplify what I mean by this. As you might know, Turkey was the second country after Chile to have been subjected to a violent transition to neoliberalism via a military coup in 1980. Shortly after the coup that wiped out the Turkish left and banned labor unions, two major structural changes were implemented in a top-down manner. The first concerned the centralization of decision-making processes and the domination of the executive over the legislative and the judiciary. And the second involved massive privatization of public resources and draconian labor market uh, adjustments that aim to improve the global competitiveness of Turkish economy. Throughout the 1980s uh, and 90s, successive civilian governments, as well as private corporations, induced Turkish society to desire unlimited consumption by encouraging the use of credit cards and individualized bank loans. The agrarian economy was forcefully dissolved thus fueling unemployment and proletarianization. The proportion of workers without social security reached a peak of 53% in 2004. But the desire for consumption increased with the spread of the debt economy down to the most precarious portions of society. When it came to power in 2001, the current ruling party, AKP, introduced a neoliberal populist program of labor market reforms that expanded flexible work forms and promoted the replacement of job security with flex security. Özden Akça and Beckman write that, I quote, with this change in the social composition of workers, it may well be argued that a new form of subjectivity has emerged that is corroding the prospect of class solidarity and collective self-identification, self unquote. The AKP managed to gain the support of broad sections of the working class by one, implementing new assistance programs aimed at the poor, 
by channeling public money in and through conservative foundations and civil society organizations loyal to our door. Two, integrating low-income households into the financial sector through the booming consumer credit market. Three, the use of religious and nationalist discourse to reconstruct weakening bonds of community among the lower and middle classes. All this was enabled by hot money flowing into Turkey due to low lending rates in global financial markets. By 2010, the AKP had formed its own compradore elite, the so-called Anatolian Tigers, and had successfully consolidated its hegemony thanks to support from the lower and middle classes who passionately strived to turn themselves into human capital, although they were also becoming more conservative in cultural terms. Erdogan also succeeded in winning the referendum that transformed the regime from a parliamentary to a presidential one, claiming that strong leadership and efficient decision-making was necessary for Turkey to face global challenges. In other words, the concentration of power in the hands of a single person was achieved legally with the consent of the majority. Referendums were also held to legitimate more executive control over the judiciary. Instead of demanding for social justice in the face of sharpening inequalities in income, the rise in household debt, the commodification of natural resources, and the financialization of social security and health insurance, growing numbers of people acquired vigilante subjectivities, being ready to punish others who hampered with their chances of getting their teeth into a piece of the neoliberal cake. The road was, was thus paved for Erdogan's top-down fascist turn until 2015, when the Gezi Park protests and uh, the success of the pro-Kurdish party in national elections delivered the message that AKP's parliamentary majority was no longer secured. But even before 2015, and I want to really emphasize this, the privatization of healthcare, education, retirement pensions, and cutbacks on state subsidies had already bred a bottom-up survivalist ethos within Turkish society. Protests against the transfer of public goods, land, and natural resources to private corporations were already framed as impediments to growth and uh, market dynamism by both the state and the average citizen. Oligarchs who flourished through new patrimonial ties were accorded the right to prey on public resources in the name of global competitiveness. Disputes were already being ethnicized, revolving around the question of who should be the rightful beneficiary of the neoliberal order. Women were being asked to withdraw into the private space of home and family and to beget at least three children to contribute to demographic growth and prosperity. Growing indifference to human rights was already depriving social movements of an important discursive tool to voice demands. Inequality was already being normalized and the distinction between political and economic goods eroded. Preemptive policing was already being used against popular dissent, framing it as a threat to security and prosperity. Neoliberalism had already effectuated a transvaluation of values, and my claim is that the fascist transgression of all limits breeds and feeds upon this transvaluation. Now, it is true that Erdogan's ostensible fascist turn involved the criminalization of all critique and dissidents, but it also involved the breakneck allocation of speculative investment deals to oligarchs loyal to him. While inflation has hit record highs today in Turkey, Erdogan's popularity is only slightly diminished since there seems to be a generalized expectation even among the precarious portions of the population that the country can now be plundered from above and from below in total impunity. So to cut a long story short, 
the Turkish experience shows how new fascisms will entail the permutation and crystallization of neoliberal forms of dehumanization, involving new techniques of power and not a reiteration of the fascisms of the 1930s. Law, democratic institutions, civil society, and even dissident struggles can now be captured from within. There is no need for any political leader to march to Rome or burn books. We have to take seriously the possibility that new fascisms will be fascisms from below, enlisting even ourselves as its willing executioners, however progressive we might like to think ourselves to be. So my <clears throat> wager is that if we fail to formulate new values that challenge the neoliberal, neo-fascist transvaluation of values, we will not be able to find ways of collectivizing existing struggles and cultivating a mode of political transversality. We must tackle the divides that now cross or complicate identitarian boundaries. We are no longer only wage earners, women, minorities, immigrants, but also creditors or debtors capable of converting ourselves into human capital or not able to adapt to flexible working conditions or not, possessing liquid assets or not, pitted against each other in the neoliberal game. But just as the feminist struggle is not only about gender in this day and age, left politics cannot only about class. Democratic struggles being waged today hint at how bodies and life chances are being dispo disposed of by the same machine across the globe, albeit differentially. Gender is lived and contested as inclusion through debt. Race is lived and contested as neoliberal extractivism. Senses of collective belonging are being diverted into welfare chauvinism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, sexism, anti-intellectualism, and so forth. To conclude, it seems to me that our task is to reconfigure identity struggles as struggles against neoliberalism and to reconfigure anti-neoliberal struggles as simultaneously struggles against fascism. Our strategy can no longer be local, although our tactics uh, shall have to be, since the troubles facing all of us are global. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Zeynep. I think we have a, a lot to debate and discuss, and I'm looking forward to this, of course. But I'm also looking very much forward to Hugo van Don. Um, Hugo is a fellow of the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies. Um, so we've been working together for quite a time. He's a coordinator of the Central de Movimientos Populares, Popular Movement Central in Sao Paulo, which is an organization that was formed through a historic process of resistance by popular movements, especially the social struggles of the 1980s for democracy and defense of urban reform and the right to the city. Um, he's uh, also working at, uh, currently at the USP, right, at the University of Sao Paulo, um, where he's a postdoctoral researcher. Um, and I'm more than glad that you can be with us, Hugo. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you so much, Boris. I'm really glad also to be here uh, sharing my perspectives. I will uh, begin my presentation by trying to characterize this uh, notion of crisis uh, that we are undergoing, more based on Brazilian reality. This is not a, an easy task at all, as we already said, given the magnitude and multidimensionality of the crisis. We are talking about economic, political, social, environmental, cultural crisis. Also, uh, it's a global and with different expressions in the various national formations, both at the center and periphery of capitalism. 
So without failing uh, to recognize this multidimensionality of the crisis and the need to discuss in depth its most va varied scopes and specificities, I intend to address three general issues that are present in the Brazilian context, but I believe uh, that, all, that also concern us all. Uh, first, the idea of a systemic crisis of capitalism. Second is related to the main political and social reactions to the crisis. On one side, the social apathy, and on the other side, this authoritarian turn uh, with uh, fascist tendencies. And finally, I want to talk about a bit also about the counter strategies uh, from the left, from the social movements. Uh, the Brazilian reality is quite emblematic to talk about the crisis because its multidimensionality is strongly demonstrated in the daily life. Uh, we are living an acute environmental crisis with the deforestation of the Amazon and other biomes uh, and natural consequences of uh, already lived. For example, just this year we had the floods uh, that killed almost 400 people uh, and left hundreds of thousands of uh, people homeless. Uh, it's an economic and social crisis with very high rates of unemployment, more than half of the population without full and permanent access to food. In just two years, hunger has, uh, hunger has practically doubled in the country. And we also are passing through the so-called stagflation, this combination of economic stagnation with high rates of inflation, with strong wage compression. And we also talk about a deep political crisis. We had a coup in 2016 against uh, President Dilma Rousseff and the election of the far-right president uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who makes almost daily threats of a new coup saying he will not accept any result in the elections that we will have this year in October. Um, we live uh, under the shadow that Bolsonaro will follow Trump's footsteps in case of electoral defeat, but with an aggravating factor in the Brazilian case that he's a retired military and has broad bases in the army to trying to support the, the eventual coup. So in this context of deep crisis, uh, we see in Brazil and as in other national contexts, uh, two main, as I already said, kind of social reaction to that. In different ways, uh, that in different ways contribute to the extension of the crisis. I'm talking here about the reaffirmation of the neoliberal order, even by those who are directly affected by the crisis. Um, with a, a social apathy uh, within the crisis. And on the other hand, as I already said, the opposition to the crisis by the defense of an alternative or order, but uh, authoritarian with fascist tendencies. So it's crucial uh, to facing that uh, to understand uh, what crisis, what kind of crisis we are facing. And for that, I, uh, I will follow the ones who uh, interpret the crisis by using the concept of interregnum. And uh, I will say now why I understand that this is an uh, important notion to understand the, the current moment we are living. Uh, I'm based here more on the notion of the German sociologist Wolfgang Streck, who recovers the same notion in his book, How Will Capitalism End? His argument has a similar aspect to the original Gramscian formulation, as Boris read here, uh, this idea of the crisis of hegemony in which the dynamic of coercion and consensus, the, coer the coercion prevails. Uh, the dominant class possess the authority, the strength, the capacity to ensure domination through coercion. But there is in his interpretation an important, an imp an important distinction. Uh, there is an important distinction uh, from the Gramscian formulation. And here I'm referring uh, uh, that Gramsci envisioned uh, the new beginning, uh, the new being born. Uh, a not too distant overcoming of uh, the declining capitalism by socialism. 
Streck, on the contrary, uh, brings the idea of a lasting interregnum, a prolonged period of social entropy. So capitalism is defined as a social order that, for its reproduction, depends on the uninterrupted accumulation of capital. But the accumulation process today faces insoluble problems, such as declining growth, increasing inequality, the suspension of liberal democracy and the rise of oligarchies, and mainly the impossibility of macroeconomic man management. This issue is particularly important um, in his interpretation because it is not only the masses that have lost the ability to act, to act collectively, but also the bourgeoisie, the dominant classes, which make the situation even more indeterminate. We are in a social context surrounded by unintended and unforeseen consequences, a situation of capitalism multimorbidity. Precisely for this reason is a period of uncertainty and indeterminacy. The interregnum would uh, be the collapse of the integration at the macro level, which deprives, deprives individuals at the micro level of an institutional structure and collective support. There is thereby a shift to the individual of the ordering of the social life, the ordering the social life. It's up to the individual to provide himself with a minimum of security and stability. This fragment, the fragmentation of war, of labor and uh, the working classes, the degradation of labor through excessive commodification and flexibilization, the global dispersion of the working classes, the huge dependence on consumption for social reproduction and deterioration of class solidarity produces the, produce the disintegration of society and of capitalism itself, but without a successor capable of overcoming it. There is a process of uh, production of social powerlessness, uh, what Adorno called dehumanization, the complete objectification of the individual in a society that places profit as the organizing principle of all dimensions of life in a complete alienation that creates the members of society in the very image of capital. This correlates the general crisis with one of the issues I mentioned at the beginning, the social apathy. Despite the disintegration within capitalist society, a significant number of people maintain the self-government required by the reproduction of the neoliberal order in which we live, integrated by incentives to overconsumption. But their expectations are stabilized only for short periods and by improvisation. For this reason, we speak of an ungovernable context in which morbid symptoms appear in all spheres, including politics. It is the morbid phenomenon of politics that brings us to that second problem I mentioned at the beginning of countering the crisis by an authoritarian turn with, with fascist uh, contours. David Harvey says, uh, states in his most uh, recent book that the austerity measures and free market economics seems to be producing a parallel uh, madness in the political sphere. This scenario described here, prolonged period of social entropy, deinstitutionalization, de loss of capacity for collective action, even by the bourgeoisie themselves, had as a political consequence the emergence of what Professor André Singer from the University of São Paulo called autocratism with a fascist tendency. And I will present this uh, based on Brazilian political scene. Among the various factions of Brazilian ruling classes, uh, I mean the industry, the financial sector, agribusiness, among others, there was the expectation that Bolsonaro would stabilize conflicts and guarantee governability around their interests. And to advance an, eco an economic program in their favor, openly pro-capital, they mobilized conservative and religious sentiments of broad sectors of Brazilian society that in this scenario of social entropy of the interregnum, assumed the anti-social thoughts that occupied the vacuum left by the failure of the state under neoliberal rule. 
Here, the reference is directly to Brazil, but we find common features uh, in phenomena such as Trump in the US and Orban in Hungary and among others already uh, cited here. Despite local specificities, uh, we can point as common elements of the political practice of these leaders, the use of post-truth and violent rhetoric against those who have been raised up as public enemies, such as immigrants, the poor, left-wing activists, women, the black population, and the LGBTQIA plus population. So the notion of autocratism is grounded in the understanding that this authoritarian turn is supported by the rise of personalities, of leaders who tend to short-circuit institutions for the benefit of social or personal power. This brings difficulties for political analysis because as Marxists, we seek to understand political action by the social forces that mobilize it. They are present in every, in every form of authoritarianism, obviously. In Bolsonaro's case, there is a base more directly identified with him, uh, supporting his government, as I already said, the military and programs groups, Christian conservative religious groups and agribusiness, the industrials, financial sectors, uh, and uh, also a wider base of support in business sectors in the middle class and diverse sectors of popular classes. But relying on permanent mobilization of his supporters, Bolsonaro seeks to build an increasing personalization of power with some degree of independence even from his social base, his minions, seeking to remove any restraint or counterweight uh, of, from the power system. That is why during his government, there are many discontinuities. Alliances are made and broken at every moment. There is a political zigzag that confuses everyone, but the unity around his personality is maintained. And why? The, hypo the hypothesis is that it operates through a fascist tendency related to the form of communication, propaganda, and mobilization that he uses. Um, so, we are not facing the reproduction of historical fascism, but the typically fascist propaganda that is based on attrib attributing to specific groups, scapegoats, the imaginary blame for the difficulties that capitalism creates. Bolsonaro and other leaders as him attract per uh, authoritarian personalities and keep them mobilized by a defined communicational strategy that promotes domination through disconnection with reality. Faced with this rather gloom scenario, I, I enter in the third and last question. I think I don't have enough time to that, but uh, I will just mention uh, that we can find in this context the counter strategies with uh, some potential of change. At the time subsequent of Bolsonaro's election, there was uh, this mobile this mobilized base that I described, but also uh, a lot of apathy, as already said, a certain paralysis of the popular movements and unions, a lot of fear uh, of what this authoritarian turn would mean in terms of uh, armed violence against leaderships and organizations. But I think this changed a bit during the pandemic. Bolsonaro behaved, uh, uh, as I think most of you know, uh, in a criminal and genocidal manner. Uh, with the, his, in addition to his nihilist uh, uh, rhetoric, such as saying that COVID was that COVID was just a little flu, he has demonstrably denied the advanced buying of vaccines from Pfizer and promoted ineffective medicines. It is estimated that hundreds of thousands of people died. Therefore. But there was, during the pandemic, a response from the movements with the creation of support and solidarity networks in the poor neighborhoods, which gave grounds for the return of organized actions, both in the logic of self-help, of providing food and hygiene materials to the poor, and in the political social struggle. Already in March 2020, a campaign was started that involved food donations, organization of community kitchens, community bakeries, collective urban vegetable gardens in different parts of the country. Just the organization I belong to, the Central of Popular Movements, has distribu distributed in two years alone more than 
320,000 tons of food by these different initiatives. At the same time, at the same time, also in the first semester of 2020, we had two mobilizations that surprised everyone, including the traditional leftist organization. Uh, one was organized by uh, the organized football fans, something that you uh, similar as you what you call here the ultras, but is more organized in Brazil. Uh, they did uh, demonstrations, protests uh, for democracy and against fascism in uh, June, between May and June uh, of 2020. Uh, something that had not happened since the 80s in Brazil. And also we had uh, uh, protests of the app delivery workers with work stoppage that was also surprising. And given this context, in July 2020, the traditional social organizations decided to resume the coordination between social movements and unions to build up an opposition for the end of the Go Bolsonaro government. The national campaign out Bolsonaro was launched and organized large street protests in Brazil in 2021. So there are several uh, interesting details about these and also the, the presidential election scenario and that we will we are passing through this year we have elections in october i can share what i think about this uh during the the, the questions and, and answers um but I, I i want just to close by stressing the importance of building uh, an international research agenda that advances the understanding of the crisis i think we should have a permanent dialogue on this team between researchers from different parts of the world, the South and North, to better understand the context we live in and above all, uh, trying to understand how to organize the working classes dismantled by this crisis, by the neoliberalism. And I think we should do this more frequently and be uh, uh, together trying to understand better uh, this moment, this conjecture that we are living and passing through. Thank you. Thank you so much to the three of you for these uh, really great inputs. I have a lot of questions, but I'm sure that you all have a lot of questions. So I think I would like just prefer to kind of right away uh, hand the mic to you because there's a lot of people working on this and interested in this. Um, just um, meanwhile, you're thinking your questions. I just uh, recapitulate quickly on 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 some of the issues that I uh, just wrote down. Um, I think there's an important question of, of how the crisis is actually lived. Um, you address, you all address these in different ways. And I think this is a, an important question of how, how this kind of same crisis is actually lived, perceived and inhabited in different ways and in different contexts. I think there's a very important question on, of course, like the subjects of authoritarian mobilization, like what political subjects are there. And this is, a, uh, I think, the um, um, differences um, that like kind of pop up here also have a very important strategic uh, dimension to it, because I think um, it is, of course, very different if we see authoritarianism like as a kind of, to say it like provocatively, uh, manipulation strategy from the dominant classes or to, uh, in, in also provocatively from Zeynep, like uh, fascism from below. So where do we have to intervene? Where do we have to look, uh, look, at, uh, look at? I think this is uh, very crucial. Um, and uh, of course, the whole question of whether uh, neoliberalism is in crisis uh, or just like uh, showing its even uglier face than before is, is also important because I think it relates to a question of if we understand, like as some people do, uh, authoritarian mobilization as a kind of um, yeah, uh, like a bit uh, stupid rebellion, yeah, like what has been uh, in, in historical terms in, uh, for German fascism been coined by, by people like the socialism of the, of the stupid guys, let's say. Um, or um, if this is, uh, as Seineb suggests, like 
uh, wild, crazy uh, affirmation of the worst aspects of neoliberalism together with this amalgam of uh, racist, sexist, and so on, um, 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 opinions and practices. So I think this is, has very, very important strategic questions, which is uh, a question that I think we should uh, take some time, um, maybe a bit later, to discuss, which is where do we have to intervene? Where do we have to look at um, for, um, for mobilizing, for changing what, um, what I think, uh, Seineb, you, you mentioned, like a reconstruction of values of um, rethinking identity politics and uh, social, economic and social struggles. Um, you mentioned uh, the question of mobilizing around certain uh, topics and the question of concrete um, intervention in the living conditions of people, like distributing food, medicine, and so on. So I think this is an all um, very important points. But um, I would really like to hand the mic um, to you um, right away. Um, I'm sure that you'll have questions. I don't know if we have a mic. If not, I can, but now then we, we are left without any mic here. So uh, I think one we should. Yeah, but then I hear you. this one's working. Yeah, no. yeah but then she, then Sainab cannot answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, David. That was, uh... um, thank you, all three of you. That was really interesting. Um, my question is for uh, Zainab. Um, I'm really interested in your mobilization of fascism and new fascism. Um, I guess my understanding of fascism is that it's a reactionary force. I don't know if this is the same way that you interpret fascism. Um, or is it for you something that has sorts of historical roots and, and historical legacies that inform its strong mobilization from below? So basically, why does it resonate right, with people? And Particularly in the case of Turkey, does that have anything to do with Ottomanization um, under Erdogan, for example, or this notion of the return to the glory of the Ottoman Empire? Does that in any way inform this kind of um, what you interpret as fascism? Thank you. We can, we can collect some, uh, I don't know, comments. Of course, you can also comment um, or questions if there are uh, already some more. I just have a short question for understanding to uh, Zeynep, because you said that there's like the novelty of the situation now is the mixing of political and economic and civil uh, power and civil society, so that there's not really any differences anymore. But for me, I'm not quite sure what is the new part of the situation, because I feel like that has been going on always. I think that the old Cold, uh, old cold War, like the, the first Cold War was also never just a conflict between states, but also of private actors, of capital, of TNCs who were part, taking part in this conflict. The whole colonial project was a project of private companies who were then uh, cooperating with the state or being taken over. So the separation for me never really existed, but I think there is a new quality to the situation now. So I think that would be interesting if you could say a bit more on that. Is there, yeah? Exactly. yeah? Hello, yes. Thank you very much. I enjoyed a lot of, um, so my, my question is like a briefly is related with the question of reactionary. So we, with the characterization of reactionary forces because of Fessin referred to that. And my question is, if in this uh, current authoritarian turn, are we dealing with like reactionary forces? I mean, so for that react to someone, so for that are like passive, you know, and the other has the initiative, or we are, or we are dealing with uh, forces, political, cultural, social forces that has a project, that have a project, a project of society, a project of subjectivity, a project, a cultural project, a project of future. I mean, so, um, so my question is, so is, so can can be this authoritarian term characterized as a reaction to someone, or can be characterized as a project of someone, of something? Sorry. 
Um, the, the other question is about, so because this idea of interregnum, interregnum was, uh, so was very, very debated here, so today, okay, it's, it's, it's valid to understand of this authoritarian turn or not. Um, but the question is, uh, it, it's, it's close related to that, so because um, this idea of, uh, okay, the, we are living in a period of war, in a period of like, a, okay, are we talking about a strategy? So neoliberalism has a strategy, like in, in the same of possible future, or we are living in a kind of uh, confusion, you know, so like, even, even by the leading classes, even by, you know, by, by the neoliberal forces. This is my, so how, how we can characterize that? Same, I was just thinking that you cannot see, actually see the room, which is a pity. So maybe at some point we can <laughs> turn uh, the ca camera around. I would, I would suggest that we make maybe one round of uh, answers first, yeah? With these, uh, th with these uh, three comments and questions. Um, Alex, do you want to start? No? Okay, so Zeynep, then please. Um, would you be so kind uh, to start? Yes, thank you for the questions. These are, of course, quest questions that are very difficult to answer in a knowledgeable manner because we are going through this process and trying to think as it is happening. One um, uh, thing that I want to underline about um, fascism and why I want to call uh, 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 this, this, these new trends uh, fascistic uh, is that um, I believe that authoritarianism um, is institutional. Authoritarianism is a, a strategy of rule that uses, uh, uh, um, that clearly distinguishes between the rulers and the ruled, and that is in a way more structured. Um, and I think fascism, and in that I'm, I'm more... Um, my, my reading of fascism is based uh, more on uh, uh, the, 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 the book of uh, Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitarianism, where she claims that fascism um, is not a structured phenomenon. It's the opposite of structure. It's move, constant permanent mobilization. It's indistinction. It's the uncertainty and un indetermination that um, Hugo was talking about. Uh, and therefore, it is through that um, constant creation of crises uh, and insecurity that uh, the, the masses are mobilized into hanging on to power. Um, and that's also, you know, Neumann's, um, um, Franz Neumann's uh, sort of thesis that uh, the totalitarian state, the Nazi state, was a non-state. It was not even um, a, a, a modern state in the institutional sense of the term, with the separation of powers or the distinct um, uh, elements of the power bloc uh, uh, that are identifiable. Um, and that is why I see in this um, uh, neoliberal uh, thrust that has been going on for 40 years and that began with coups in Chile and Turkey and therefore can not be um, uh, 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 cannot be defined as peaceful transitions. I think the, the, the perspective from the South proves that neoliberalism began with fascism, right? Uh, it was not a smooth transition. I mean, we in Turkey, no, it was not a smooth transition. Um, and, and that neoliberalism had no problem with military dictatorships uh, uh, being, um, you know, imposed through military dictatorships. Uh, um, so, uh, but what happens is that uh, through um, uh, the civilian um, procurement of consent, uh, through the, the production of a desire for this permanent flexibility, for permanent um, uh, 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 risk-taking, permanent precarization that is at the same time an opportunity uh, to move up the social ladder. So through new techniques of 
um, governing insecurity and precarity through biopolitical techniques, through techniques that did not exist as such in the 1930s, social media, internet, uh, algorithms, etc. There is a transition, a, a transformation of subjectivities also from below. Now, is this reactionary? I think it is partially, fascism is partially reactionary, but we must understand that it is based on the transformation of subjectivities that neoliberalism has produced. There is a desire for neoliberalism, let's accept that. There is a desire for neoliberalism. Um, and, and fascism, although um, there's this um, saying by Aja Zahmet, uh, a Marxist um, Indian scholar um, who passed away um, recently actually, uh, uh, there's this saying uh, that every country gets the fascism it deserves in accordance with the, 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 the physiognomy of its history, society, and politics. And so, of course, I mean, the, in Turkey, Erdogan's Ottomanism, neo-Ottomanism, um, echoes Trump's discourse of making America great again. It's, it's, it's the Turkish um, version uh, of that... Uh, uh, mythical past, uh, reconstruction uh, uh, of the mythical past. Um, but I think we should not think of um, fascism as a, uh, uh, um, as, as, as a, a thrust or a, a motion in history that has a certain direction. Um, I don't think there's a project attached with fascism, and therefore I think we must understand fascism as a strategy that can shift and take on many forms, uh, not only the, the form of the IFT in Germany or Erdogan in Turkey, but the form of the average German citizen um, that uh, 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 portrays the immigrant as the, th the thief of the bread of honest German people, right? So that in distinction between, I, I don't think we should only look at Bolsonaro and Erdogan and IFT. I think we should look at ourselves as well in order to understand fascism, right? And how it works. Um, uh, and how we might be reproducing neoliberalism. So basically, let me cut this short. Uh, the crisis or the confused aspect of uh, fascism is what makes it fascist. You see, I don't think fascism has an ideology. It didn't in the 1930s either. It doesn't have today. It can use any ideology. It can, it is that serpent that uses all ideologies. And that's why it's more um, sinister. It's more dangerous. I don't know if I replied to questions, but we can continue discussing. Thank you, Zeynep. So, um, Alex, do you want to comment? Um, yeah, to react to Gustavo's point, is there only reaction or is there a project? This is was the kind of alternative you have in mind, yeah? Yeah, uh, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I mean what, is the pro what can be the project of a bourgeois class to save order, to give continuity to accumulation so they have strategies to to go this way, yeah, to make sure that it works. And so I think under certain conditions, circumstances, they react to um, threats to, that could endanger the way how they want to organize it. For them, it is a surprise. So they, because 
the bourgeoisie in general doesn't count with social movements, um, activities of left groups and so on. Yeah, they, I mean, in a way they know it, but it's on a very abstract level and they always think and think again. If nobody would speak about Marx, about revolution, about movements, they wouldn't exist. Yeah, being things come into being only by speaking on them. This is kind of idealistic philosophy of the bourgeois class, yeah, in a way. And so they, and then they react and, and of course many of the things of how so, social societies are organized, they are organized in a way of, how to say, counter-revolutionary, they, and they react in preemptive perspectives, yeah, how, to, how they can organize social processes in a way that resistance or um, left debates, feminist debates, and so on, projects could be, um, how to say, hindered or, or, yeah, I mean, not coming up, yeah, this is in, so I think it's, maybe not an alternative, you know? So, but I, in my eyes, the bourgeois class has not a, 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 a project for in, in terms of how to, it's, it's always, uh, the maximum is modernization, yeah? To, to make sure that competitiveness is sure, yeah? I mean, like the EU, and now they have the problem, what will happen after the, Russian Ukrainian war. Yeah, what will happen then? Because now there is a retreat of German or European investments in China. Yeah, so this is really, there will be a big challenge. And I think this is a challenge we have to have in mind now for also for our discussions. How they will reorganize the societies because the globalization process that informed so much also the the right-wing current, this is in a way, for a while, it will be something from the past, you know, because China is now seen as an enemy. They deglobalize the process of value change. Yeah, they bring the investments, the machinery back to European countries or to North America and the whole way how they reorganize the center periphery relationship now is i think will be in a deep deep way will be changed and this is a, another aspect that i'm thinking about is the problem of what um, was mentioned as authoritarian personality i mean for me it was the pandemic yeah, included one surprise, really a surprise. I expected that right-wing people would follow the line of a rigid health policy, yeah, to lock down everything and to make sure that there will be no pandemic, yeah. So, but in fact, it was the other way around. Yeah, and this deeply changed the bourgeois understanding of the concept of freedom and the role of the state, you know. And I think this should also be part of what we have to take into account for future debates because these authoritarian currents really, though they had to, to transform itself, the right, the right wing parties, like here in Germany, the AfD, yeah? Uh, uh, um, Alternative für Deutschland. Yeah? <laughs> Alternative for Germany, you know? And they, they, they really came into trouble with this because they, they had in mind to, I mean, they argued for we don't care, like Trump, like Bolsonaro, we don't care. And, and though they had always this concept of freedom, like the liberals, so it was this kind of neoliberal alliance of bourgeois parties, yeah? And, but the, they, they couldn't 
they couldn't succeed with this strategy. Yeah. So and they hadn't not in they hadn't in mind to go to argue for more rigorous state strategies. Yeah. And so it was. So the way how in Germany and many parts of Western Europe, the way how the governing, the ruling class um, organized the, the fight against the pandemic was really interesting in, with, it, with that regard. It was always a kind, yeah, what was already mentioned as a mixture, a, 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 a use of many different strategies, yeah, strengthening or weakening strategies, yeah, of how to fight it, yeah, and I think this should be also part of the, the way we think on these problems. Yeah, and it, I think it's also true in countries like um, Brazil, yeah, or the US. I mean, and this kind of social Darwinism, may, yeah, what means it's not directed against minorities, Jews, it's, it's people from elsewhere, but it's directed against the own population. Yeah, they are, they are, they have no problem to, to accept the deaths of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. This is a kind of coldness in the society. So this is what Sinab was arguing for. We have to also to look what is what we are doing in which way we are cold or have are empath empath empathetic with, with people. But this was a kind of a training just to be cold. Yeah, so as a, and, um, but it was not a, a, a rigorous, rigid strategy to fight the pandemic. And this is, I, I hope you can see, understand the problem I have with this, because my expectation was completely the other way around. Yeah, I would have them expected to really to act in very authoritarian ways. After all the debates we had in the years 15, 16, and so on. And uh, this is also uh, just a remark, very interesting how the left, at least uh, around here, reacted. Because, because they were the ones enforcing uh, the, the authoritarian laws. Right. And, and just let me mention this. I mean, there was an initiative by very people on the left, yeah, and co co connected closely to the trade unions, arguing for zero COVID strategy. And that meant complete lockdown of everything to, to kill the virus, to eliminate yeah, the virus. What in fact is, a, is something that is part of the history of fighting pandemics since the 19th century. And in my eyes, it's really in a ridiculous phantasma to think in that way. And the examples, or one of the most important examples was always China. And then look what China is doing, yeah? Now, how they cope with the problem and how they deal with the people, with the individuals, yeah? How repressive it is. And this is really crazy. It's so amazing to be this kind of, yeah? Yeah, I, I just want to add something to that because this is precisely why I think the concept of interregnal applies well to this reality because I don't see a so well organized ordering of uh, the social life from above, like a so rational governmental, governmentally uh, of the, the economy and social life. Just to give one example, again, based on Brazilian experience. Uh, on uh, September 2020, the Pfizer, the lab, offered to Bolsonaro government uh, uh, like to delivery uh, quickly uh, more than hundreds of vaccines to uh, that Brazil could be the the example of mass vaccination uh, because they know that Brazil has a a, a, group, a a strong culture of vaccination structure in the health system so it could be all population could be vaccinated in the beginning of. Uh, 2021, and Bolsonaro denied. He denied, and he, he passed more than six months uh, denying uh, 
to start the vaccination. And this is, from the point of view of capital accumulation, of capitalism, it's uh, irrational. So um, I'm, I'm just trying to give an example of uh, irrationality in the, in the governance, in this uh, a range of power. I don't see this so well uh, uh, when we talk about uh, this authoritarian turn and these uh, experiences. I don't know, I don't see this so well organized domination from the point of view of capital. They are also facing huge problems in terms of uh, capital accumulation. And even uh, seeing the center of capitalism, United States, also facing uh, problems that, like we are saying, stagflation, uh, lack of control uh, of uh, the supply chains and so on. So uh, that's precisely why I, I, I like this idea. And just to uh, also answer to Gustavo, I think uh, in these fascist uh, tendencies, there is a, a a huge uh, uh, relation to reaction, to the idea of reaction. Uh, also, again, based on Brazilian experience, I think uh, when we thought about the Workers' Party government, uh, especially under Lula in the beginning of uh, Dilma Rousseff government, we had uh, um, a slow, um, uh, gradual uh, poverty reduction without confronting capital. But uh, even without confronting capital, uh, it seems that uh, it has sharpened the distributive co uh, conflict in the country. Uh, because uh, we are talking about a dependent economy, uh, very dependent on over-exploitation of labor. So uh, any kind of social inclusion for, for the masses, uh, it touches the, what we say the nerve of the peripheral uh, economic formation. And I think that this, what we had uh, from uh, 2012 onwards was related to a reaction to that, to this model of uh, social integration, even uh, uh, when we talk about the social integration without confronting capital, or, or at, at least trying to not confront uh, capital. So I think there is a, a basis of reaction to the process that we were passing through. But, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, through this reaction, they reorganize the dominance uh, from the point of view of, view of, the, capital, of the capitalist, and uh, they, they are trying to reorganize to uh, overcome the conflict, the social conflicts, but, uh, but are lacking through this governmental, uh, governmentality. I don't know if I'm saying correct the word and uh, lack of institutions. We are passing through also a deinstitutionalization, uh, and, um, and I think we should, uh, that's why I, I try to stress this idea of interregnum and of inter indeterminacy of the moment and uh, how in this moment we, we should, uh, uh, it is important to define precisely the crisis because this, this defines the counter strategies and the possibilities of struggles. And that's, that's it. Thank you. So please, um, uh, some s several hands in the air. Zeynep, <laughs> we will turn you around. <laughs> Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, all of you. Um, I have two concerns that I've been hearing uh, coming through, uh, and I, I just worry about them. Uh, the first is, um, and I know historical examples are always crass. However, they have their purpose. Um, so, for instance, um, Zeneb, you were talking about how Erdogan had built on the neoliberalist um, wiping out of democratic um, powers, democratic structures, and people's rights before instituting a form of fascism. But that's not new. Um, for example, um, when Gramsci and the Turin movement uh, was wiped out, it was only after that that Mussolini came to power. And in fact, Mussolini actually wrote um, that this wasn't, in fact, 
necessary. So that's one thing. I think we can't forget about some of the historical lessons that, that what we're seeing now are new forms, but there's content that goes way back. And I think we're in danger of forgetting some of that. The second point I just want to make uh, very briefly, shorter, uh, is in response to Alex. I totally agree. We're facing a new situation. Uh, and that includes the moment uh, of the post-Ukrainian war. Um, but I think it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel entirely. Um, for example, I've not yet heard anyone talk about inter-imperialist contradictions. What we're in the midst of seeing now that Ukraine is the apex of right now is a redivision of the world. And China uh, and Russia and the Eurasian complexes have been working up towards this moment for quite some time. And Erdogan has played a part in many of the conferences headed up by um, Putin. So I think that that's a problem. The third very quick point that I'd make uh, is that um, I happen to be a physician. That would be beside the point, except the issue of COVID has come up. Uh, and the stark opposition uh, of China's, and I will here use the word authoritarianism, uh, although I believe China to be a fascist state, um, uh, but their authoritarian approach is counterposed to a more um, uh, don't lock down approach. Well, actually, these are two polar opposites, but they're not necessarily the right way to go from a scientific uh, virological perspective. And for instance, yesterday's New York Times had a very major article um, showing that the million dead in um, the US could have been cut to the Australian 100,000 by the moderate, more middle path of the Australian. So it's a false counterposition, I would submit. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the very interesting, engaging presentations. Um, my question is to Zeynep Gambetti. I'm really inspired um, by your take on fascism and totalitarianism. Uh, as far as I understand, you describe it as amorphous, sneaky, uh, and not relying on one particular ideology. Um, and I feel that uh, how can we think this like changing mercurial nature of fascism in relation to the different modalities, different historical moments of neoliberalism? And my inspiration for that question is that, I mean, your case, the case that you describe in my country, Turkey, um, Tayyip Erdogan, who is the, like, the biggest, uh, I don't know, the biggest example of an authoritarian leader, came to power as a democratizing leader and for almost a decade was celebrated. But around that time, too, he was like, uh, this neoliberalizing agenda was on the forefront. Forefront but maybe a little bit like hidden by the more democratizing reforms in the field of civil society. Can we think this in relation to the cynic ways of fascism? Or is there a, or is there a historical change in the way neoliberalism functioned? I mean, is this like a continuity or at some point there happened to be a break? I uh, would like to hear your comments on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this is a question more directly for, for Hugo. Um, what do you think the role of, of the PT as, as a progressive government in Brazil was in creating this, the, the process that came to uh, give power to Bolsonaro? What's the, 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 in, in Latin America, there is a, this zigzag in the recent decades between progressive governments, or developmental governments, and these uh, more authoritarian governments. Well, there has to be a relationship, I think, between what progressive governments have been doing that gave place to these more authoritarian 
the processes, especially if people then come to support Bolsonaro, for example, governments for a while now. It's, it's probable, we don't know, that Lula will win this year. It's a possibility. But will that change the, the general um, movement of Brazilian society in this sense? That's it. Okay, just uh, to have like some uh, time horizon. We started 15 minutes late. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We just uh, we started 15 minutes late. I'd suggest we st uh, finish 15 minutes late as well, which means that we have like some some like uh, okay, let's say eight nine minutes, um, because I can feel that maybe you are getting hungry and then so just have some more time. One question. Yeah, thank you for very interesting talks. Um, what I was wondering about, I also see the situation as chaotic. I should start with, with that. But what I also see are attempts by, um, you could say, intellectuals representing various power blocks and capital interests trying to um, create something um, new. And I was wondering what you make of those attempts because it felt as if you in your talks very much highlighted the, the chaotic aspect so on the one hand um, there are people like Elon Musk or Peter Thiel who um, yeah present themselves in a certain ways as saviors of capitalism and it seems to me what they take from neoliberalism is this strong belief in um, corporate solutions for social problems, what they do not um, um, accept in sort of more classical neoliberalism, I guess, is that they believe in monopolies. They think transnational corporations um, that are monopolies are great um, and they can use big data and through that um, um, improve society and, and solve the world's problems. And I mean, we see that with the Ukraine war and Elon Musk stepping in and providing um, um, the internet uh, in the Ukraine um, through his satellite systems. So this is, this is one option that I see. There's another option, and I, I was wondering especially what you think about this, Alex, because you juxtapose stupidity and knowledge, which is more of a conservative left liberal bloc that I see emerging, especially in Germany, but also some other European countries that is now militarized, um, that is buying into the idea of reforming capitalism along the line of yeah, addressing climate change, moving towards a green capitalism. And, that, and that's why I raised the, the, the question of stupidity and knowledge that very much believes in science and defends science against you know, those people out there who've been protesting against the COVID measures and so forth. Um, and aren't we in a trap in a certain way if we defend rationality, if we, we defend um, knowledge that on the one hand, yes, um, there's much to be said about the irrationalities of uh, present day capitalism, neoliberalism, or whatever it is, but on the other hand, the people propagating science often are part of the problem and often very much um, use a tone that is condescending towards popular forces, towards working class people, to, uh, towards people who are discontent um, and who truly believe that, you know, if we are rational, if we believe in experts and expertise, we can build... Um, uh, a new and better capitalism that resolves all the different crises that we're facing. Thank you. Ugo, do you, do you want to ask? Ah, so we have uh, two more. Uh, so let's let's collect uh, these uh, more questions in the room. I'd suggest, and then we make just one last round. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thanks a lot uh, for this really great panel and this really great conference. Um, I've been thinking about these questions from the Canadian context, you know, where we have a liberal feminist government 
And we also just were the site of this massive trucker convoy that occupied the capital and a state of emergency had to be declared to disrupt them because the police weren't acting. So, uh, you know, I've been thinking about the rise of the right and, you know, it also long predates the financial crisis. But I really uh, resonate with Zainab's um, description of fascism as this um, um, opportunistic amalgam. Um, and I think that this actually says a lot about what's going on in Canada right now in terms of the Conservative Party and how it is um, mobilizing these forces in, in what look like quite irrational ways. And that there, it, there's no clear social project, but there is a mobilization underway. Um, and so this is really just a, a comment on that. And um, the other thing to say is that back to the original conversation about the crisis of civilization, um, I was present at the World Social Forum through the 2000s when this was in discussion in Latin America. And actually the main carriers of that kind of discussion at the time were the indigenous movements of the Americas. And in the Canadian context, the most radical and promising movements that are uh, mobilizing against neoliberalism and against fascism are indigenous movements. And they are actually mobilizing quite different discourses than those of the historic left. And I think it you know, behooves us to actually think about what kind of crisis we need to talk about and what kind of civilization is in crisis and what other kinds of ontologies are available to think about alternative futures. Um, I have been thinking a little bit about this uh, reply just now that we have to look for authoritarianism or fascism in our own subjectivities, not only looking at the IFD or Bolsonaro or authoritarian leaders. And I think this is convincing in some way, but in the other way, I think there's also a trapping because you can fall right back into this neoliberal self-optimization and self-governance. And so I think how can we prevent that from happening? Because this has been by, uh, suggested by political psychologists for the last six decades, but it always tends to fall back into these neoliberal traps. So that is my question. Thank you to all of you. And just connecting with these last two comments, especially, I would really love to hear from the three of you like one uh, f final um, remark also on where do you think like strategic intervention should happen? Like where, where do we have to operate? Like I know it's, Will always be like too short and so, but I think I, I would like to, um, to 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 hear uh, from you on this on this issue. Um, so first of all, thank you again. Uh, it's the last uh, intervention. Yeah, I would like to thank you again for all your comments and questions. It was a very interesting debate, and uh, I'm really glad to participate. Um, I will just try to answer um, the question from Mariano. I, I think that uh, the Works Party government uh, did promote important policies uh, related to a certain kind of social integration and uh, uh, promotion of uh, rights in different spheres like um, education and especially in the labor, increasing the minimum wage and so on. But uh, on the other hand, and this is related to what you, you asked, uh, I think we have, uh, uh, I think our, our social, our political forces in Latin America are very, very, very stated centered and believe in, in uh, guided by a developmentalist uh, ideology and uh, and that in its uh, beginning uh, had this uh, expectation of uh, promoting the modernization of the country and the integration of the countries uh, within the global capitalism through uh, building this alliance between the, the bourgeoisie, especially the industrials, uh, and the working classes. They, they had this, they, uh, there is, this is a strong, uh, uh, project for uh, uh, the center, center left in Latin America. And I think uh, the Workers' Party governments didn't uh, 
was uh, an exemption of that. Uh, and the opposites, they, they did promote this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, ideal, of governmentality. And um, uh, this, uh, what I want to stress uh, with this is this uh, uh, idea of promoting transformation through the state, through the control of uh, the executive power and, uh, and uh, from above. Uh, uh, that's what I, I'm trying to mention. And uh, this produces uh, a lot of contradictions uh, within society. And uh, as it was, as I said, without confronting capital, uh, we, we should uh, uh, think about this process as state-led and uh, 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 being followed by commodification, by, uh, by the promotion of market interests in different uh, uh, spheres of, uh, of society. So this produces strong uh, contradictions. Contradictions on one side, as I said, by the inclusion policies, contradictions between labor forces and capitalist forces because we had a wage increase and this uh, produced a distributive conflict, very important, and I think the reaction from capital comes because of that. But on the other side, we had also different kinds of contradictions related to mass consumption, related to the commodification of life that was also present. So this combination produces the, uh, this reaction that I tried to describe here, a reaction from the capital that, that was able to mobilize uh, sentiments uh, within society, reactionary sentiments, pro-capital sentiments that produce the social basis of, uh, of uh, this, what, what I'm following here, this autocratism with fascist tendencies. Uh, and about the, the challenges now, I, I, uh, I think we have, uh, it is, uh, uh, despite this, Characteristics and these contradictions that I'm, I'm, I'm saying here. I think the, the elections this year is really, really important because uh, uh, more, uh, four years more of uh, being governed by Bolsonaro, I think, would be a disaster uh, for Brazil and for Latin America. And I, I do think that. Uh, and that's why if most of the leftist forces are already uh, supporting Lula's election. So I think we, uh, this is a very important test that the left has in Brazil to, re to elect again Lula, but uh, knowing that all these contradictions that we faced uh, in the first government will be again present and intensified because if this, uh, this, a diagnosis of uh, that we are living in a new period of interregno, of uh, ungovernmentally, of uh, indeterminacy. Uh, we can expect that the the possibilities of uh, this peace formula that Lula produces are very low. Uh, I, 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 what I expect is a very conflictive and a very uh, a government under permanent crisis. This is what we should, I think, expect. So uh, to face that, I think the leftist forces uh, should follow what she said, uh, follow the, I, I don't remember your name, I'm sorry, the, yes, you, the last question. I think we, we should try to think uh, from different perspectives. I agree that we have in Latin America very important uh, indigenous movements and other popular movements that are trying to show uh, other ways to overcome uh, the crisis through the promotion of solidarity, through uh, movements within society. Yes, and, and I think this is, this is the way that we should follow, trying to build this force from below uh, integrating and uh, uh, um, sharing different perspectives from people that are suffering from the consequence of the crisis and uh, um, and uh, trying to build a new a new uh, way of uh, leading with our social, political, and economic pro problems uh, that are uh, huge, that are historical, that. Um, 
but I think we have the, if we are in an interregnum, in the crisis of hegemony, this is precisely uh, the moment that uh, the subaltern classes, the people from below, are more, have more possibilities to organize themselves and uh, try to build an alternative in, uh, in a more, in a democratic socialism perspective. That's what I believe and I think I, we have the condition to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. So, um, Seineb, um, would you like to continue? Yes, thank you very much. This is a very interesting um, and thought-provoking uh, um, panel. I'm glad. I have lots of questions myself. I cannot answer them, um, uh, but we'll continue to reflect on them. Let me start with uh, one of the questions on, on Turkey. Um, I think that was a, a, a question that explains a couple of other uh, um, issues that were brought about. How can we periodize um, Erdogan's uh, shifting forms of uh, uh, governmentality within the neoliberal um, sort of um, narrative? Uh, because Erdogan in uh, the, the 2000s was seen as the democratizing force, not only by the conservative portions of society, but also by Europe by academics and by um, portions of um, uh, social democratic left. Um, why was this? Uh, uh, Erdogan's project was to bring down the, the power or to dissolve the power of the Kemalist establishment, which included the, um, uh, the stronghold of the army over society. And therefore, the 2000s was a period of deinstitutionalization. Now, uh, I'm not defending, of course, the army, etc., but the, um, the dissolution of the institutional uh, uh, um, strongholds of the Kemalist secular uh, establishment actually did allow for a realignment of political, economic and, and social forces within Turkey and the fluidification or mercurial um, sort of um, a character uh, of both neoliberalism. Neoliberalism, I argue once again, is responsible for de-democratization and de-institutionalization even in the West or North, however you term it. And therefore, um, it was not Erdogan that de-democratized um, Turkey. Uh, 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 Turkey has been de-democratized first by a fascist coup, then through civilian governments, uh, uh, through the 1980s and the 1990s, establishing and promoting the uh, survivalism and the, the flexibilization that neoliberalism and neoliberal uh, project, let's say, um, uh, entails and requires. Erdogan then came upon that landscape to dismantle the remaining institutions within the country. Uh, which actually completed or perfected the neoliberal thrust, right? Um, so, uh, uh, and why did uh, 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 the, the ostensibly fascist face reappear? It was, it was said uh, by Alex and, and Hugo as well, there were a series of crises in, in Turkey as well. The 2008 crisis in the world hit the, the economy, Turkish economy, and there were social uh, mobilizations, especially in the 2013 uh, period where Gezi, uh, uh, the Occupy Gezi movement uh, uh, reunited and allied uh, a lot of frustrations uh, together. Um, and, but also the Kurdish, the pro-Kurdish party HDP launched its project that it called the New Life, 
Now, these two moments of crisis were actually the only serious challenge to Erdogan's rule during this 20-year period. Why were they the most serious challenge? Because they were offering new values and they were articulating the different uh, uh, demands of social movements uh, uh, in such a way as to offer a political and economic and environmental alternative to both neoliberalism and to the centralized uh, sort of um, state rule. But I have to underline, the Turkish left kept its distance with these two moments. The Turkish left was not part of Gezi Park protests. It, the Turkish left thought that the Gezi Park protests were like, you know, spontaneous, uh, uh, fleeting, uh, uh, associations among movements that would only identitarian, not enough class perspective, not enough anti-imperialist, not enough uh, sort of Marxist in their outlook. Likewise, the Kurdish party was uh, 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 distanced from uh, uh, certain leftist groups because it also advocated uh, ethnic um, uh, 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 reinvestment of ethnic uh, um, pride alongside anti-capitalist um, uh, uh, sort of uh, mobilization. So these two moments actually required the comeback of the fascist, ostensible fascist reflex in neoliberalism. And uh, therefore, we can say to complete the project, uh, Erdogan needed to crush the Kurdish movement, criminalize Gezi, as you know, Osman Kavala is uh, uh, um, now um, receiving life punishment for so-called financing the Gezi Park movement. Uh, just want to underline, I know this is, um, um, I cannot do justice to these questions, but I don't think we should think of um, capitalism and imperi the imperialist struggle, the imperialist conflicts uh, in the globe as through nationalist perspectives. Whether China and uh, uh, Russia and the US and the EU will align um, themselves, etc., I think is of secondary importance to the fact that financial capital finds always new uh, uh, creatively destructive uh, venues for itself. So China might rise, the US might, uh, we, uh, might um, um, fluctuate in its control for some time, uh, uh, but this will not impede financial capital from continuing the accumulation process through other actors, new actors, new networks between oligarchs, etc. I don't think we, we can uh, nationalize the, the imperialist projects anymore. And lastly, I think, I really do think, too much historicism uh, uh, makes us... Um, miss the novelty of today's fascism. I don't think this had, has been lived in the 1930s in the same way, because states were in the 1930s more or less coherent actors. Today, what we call a state is just an effect amalgamation of private civil society and uh, sort of fragmented bureaucratic um, ensembles and completely um, um, guided and oriented by finance capital and therefore losing any, any instance of uh, autonomy it had vis-a-vis -vis the other forces in society. I think we should see this novelty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zeynep, and um, Alex, some closing remarks. Yeah, <coughs> it is, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, just to, to say that uh, in the final round, thank you again for organizing it. And it was a, in particular you. So I found it, I find it great that we have these discussions that are so necessary. And I think, yeah, so starting with that point, just mentioning it, I, I think I have a disagreement with Sinep in that, with regard to this, yeah? I mean, I'm, I'm sure I, or I would agree that state is, in, is an effect of those activities in civil society. This is, state is, as we know since Gramsci, is something that is organized by different forces and groups to, to, to give their power a kind of continuous uh, continuity. But um, I mean, it's not, I mean, nevertheless, it's a field, a terrain of struggles and compromises and strategies, how societies should be organized and uh, developed in, into the future. This brings me to this, so I take it more serious, uh, seriously what will maybe happen. And I, so I come back to you in the back with this question of, of um, yeah, what will happen or we, what, how imperialism, which role plays imperialism or the new um, form that can take place. And I mean, I mean, just to mention this, I think what we experiencing now is really kind of an realignment with, um, with maybe heavy consequences for all of us. I mean, more so in the US, in North America, in, in Europe, in Russia, in China. And I think so, so far as I see it now with the goal, so the United States are in favor for, yeah, they give support to, to the Ukrainian military strategy. I mean, it's Musk who uses the, the satellites for, for the intelligence services of the Ukrainian army. So though this is part of the development and um, maybe, so my, my idea or my, my um, impression is that one of the intention is to dismantle even or dissolve Russia as a state. Yeah, I mean, it's a colonial state, so there will be maybe some dissolvements of this state. And, this, and finally have a war with China or going in the direction to have strong pressure, heavy pressure on China and to weaken China because the EU as the United States are arguing that this is now a systemic competitor and has to be weakened for economic reasons, for uh, military reasons. And this includes also Weltraum is space. No? So it includes also the military forces and relations in space. Yeah? So it goes to weaken yeah, the, the claims of Russia in the polar zone, in the space, and it will weaken also the role of China in the space. So this is what I, this is my fear, what could happen, and what maybe the, will be the final aim of the strategy of the US to be, in fact, a unilateral or unipolar organized imperialism to, to, to overcome those imper, imperialist um, um, confrontations and also weakening the EU. I mean, this is what is also part of the war in the Ukraine. It's also the role of the EU in this context, in the context of the NATO. Yeah, this is, in my eyes, an important role. And, um, yeah, and it's for me, it's not at all clear what the outcome of this, these conflicts between the EU, more so Germany and the US will be. I mean, there is a, 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 a heavy pressure on the social democratic government with a kind of historical revisionism of more than 50 decades of what is called Ostpolitik. Alex, I agree with you. 
Musk and Peter Thiel, yeah, I, I followed what their, their aim so, so far as I can do it. I mean, but I think it's really interesting what they want to do also with the, 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 the conquista of the state, space, so to speak, yeah, I mean, and to bring resources from, from other planets to the Earth to solve in that way the resource problem, what is the one of the aspects of the whole program. And then for me, the question is, is that a project that would solve any problem? And I think it wouldn't solve any problem. And that's the reason why I answered to Gustavo's question, there is no project. Yeah, I mean, they think they have one, yeah, to, to, to a corporate solution, all these irrational, relig religious motivated strategies in the Bay Area, um, the people, yeah, and, and I think they won't solve any of these problems we are confronted with. I mean, the problem of climate change and the way how we produce the accumulation strategies and so on. But I think it's worth to go deeper into the details because Peter Thiel is one of the guys who give a lot of money for Trump. He's a right winger, so he is also in support of fascist tendencies in the US. And I think that's also true for Musk. When you think how he's does, he's, he is discussing his ownership of Twitter and bring in Trump in again in Twitter. So I think there is this is will be a serious challenge for for us. Yeah, and um, and um, yeah, the last point. The, what is also important with regard to this is um, I argued in defense of knowledge, and this is a kind of an anti-fascist attitude. Yeah, from my background, critical theory, argue for rationality and um, how to say, research, social, social knowledge, theory that is relevant. And I mean, this is of course the historical background for this defense was the plot and honor strategy of the fascists in the 20s and 30s. And these fascists today yeah, or the authoritarians from today, they are not in the same way irrational than the fascist has been in, the, in that period, yeah, in, his, in that historical period. I mean, you refer to this, that they make research, but a second or a minute research in the internet, you know, and then they, they what they do is exactly what the fascists in the 40s and 50s did, everything, everything seems to be only an opinion. Science research done for decades is reduced to opinion of only one section of knowledge. And this is something we have to resist to. This is not an opinion. What we're doing is not an opinion. So we should avoid the idea that we only make use of demo so-called democratic opinions. It's not an opinion. Science or theory is not an opinion. It's, an, it's a knowledge based on research, on long-lasting work. Yeah? What we do and we have to do and we have to defend it also inside the left because the left doesn't take it seriously what theory and scientific research is about. Yeah, so, and I think we should, we should argue, and I see the trap, yeah, I, that I agree with you, and I think this is one of the things I had in mind when I spoke before about the transformation of the right. They read Gramsci. They know how the left is arguing. And they transform themselves. They now use the concept of democracy very fluently. I mean, everything was prepared by Karl Schmidt in the 20s, but the Nazis never made, made use of this argument about democracy. Yeah? Karl Schmidt prepared them to argue, look, you can also defend leadership in terms of democracy, but they didn't. They were against the so-called system. Today, the right wing is arguing in, on behalf of democracy, yeah, or science, knowledge, and so on. 
So, but at the same time, they reduce everything to only to be only an opinion. And I see this, I mean, more so in Switzerland, where the right party is very often criticizing and discrediting scholars by saying, yeah, the, the people doing research in, in climate or in gender or in, in criti criticism of neoliberal economy, and it always the same argument. It's only an opinion, and this is not worth to be part of, un of the university. They should be um, kicked off the out of the university and so on and so on, So because it's not neutral. And I think this is also, so this is from my side, a, a strategic point, yeah, to argue for a partisan knowledge, yeah, a knowledge that is, takes it's it's um, yeah it's a, it's part of of something bigger a fight for yeah freedom democracy socialism communism yeah in that way to solve the problems we have to deal with yeah in the next decades yeah thank you Thank you very much. And this means that we have come to the right place. This is a strong and very beautiful claim. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to uh, Debbie, the technical personnel that have been supporting this, of course.